why multi-slice CT really took over from the single slice CT, and there's no looking back now. But first, at the turn of the last century was the Slice Wars. But we're not talking about Darth Vader, Darth Maul, or Darth Sidious, but we're talking about CT scanning, and the Slice Wars were really when all the vendors started going from single slice to four slice, 16 slice, 64 slice, and everything was talking about slices. So the slice wars were really big in CT. And what started all the slice wars? Why did we want to go to multi-slice CT instead of doing the standard single slice CT that had been done for years before that? Think about your patient lying on the table here and they're pretty happy because they know they're about to help get a better diagnosis for their condition. And the idea is you have an x-ray tube right here and you've got your detector down here. This is the old days of single slice CT. Often the slices would be pretty thick in that direction. So in axial scanning, the x-ray tube would go around and the detector would go around. They're always facing one another 180 degrees apart. and to make one image, you go around one rotation. Multi-slice CT is actually the idea that you could take that same width in the detector and you could chunk it up into smaller scintillators. So the detector is actually made of a scintillator as we talked about in our CT detector lecture. And if the detector is separated along that Z direction, that's gonna give us several advantages including making thinner slices in the Z direction so that we can get essentially isotropic images in CT. If you've been using CT lately, you probably take this for granted because it's been like that for some time. But if you only had the ability to make thick slice images as in the early days of single slice CT, you will get an image like this one here on the left you can tell that there's a brain in there, but you can't see in these reformat images much of the gray white matter and the calvarium or the bone actually looks all pixelated and choppy. You have relatively thin slice images to your reading of the reformats. The quality can be much better where you can well appreciate now the ventricles and you can also appreciate the differences between the gray and the white matter and the calvarium itself looks nice and smooth as you would expect. In addition to being able to natively generate these isotropic images, it's also a more efficient acquisition from the perspective of the dose of the patient. So if you think about the x-ray beam that's coming down, there's what we call an umbra, which is the region in the middle. And then there's what we call a penumbra, which is the region at the edge. If you have a relatively narrow detector in the Z direction like shown here, you can see that the width of the umbra is relatively smaller because we want to cover the detector. Penumbra is the region in which there is some x-ray irradiation happening, but there's not enough to make a good quality image that's consistent with the rest of the images. Because of this, there's some of the penumbra that has to be outside of the imaging region. That is essentially wasted dose. So that extra penumbra, if you look at it on the narrow collimation case, you can see there's a penumbra here. And on the wide collimation case, there's also the penumbra. And the relative fraction that's penumbra compared with the umbra is actually higher in the narrow collimation case. So the wider collimation case is more efficient because every time you have this amount of wasted radiation in the penumbra, you're getting a much wider region of good radiation in the umbra. This is why the wider collimation has a higher, what we call geometric efficiency than the very narrow collimations. Also an efficiency gain from the standpoint of the tube heating. So in both cases, if you have a relatively narrow collimation, or if you have a relatively wide collimation, in both of those cases, you actually have to have the same amount of tube heating because the x-rays are coming out isotropically and they're actually being stopped by the collimator. So there's collimator material in here which is stopping the x-rays 
And many more of the x-rays are actually going into patient imaging when you're using a wider acquisition than when you're using that narrow acquisition. Increase in efficiency actually allows you to complete more volumetric scans without overheating an x-ray tube. So on the systems, even though the slices are relatively thin so that we can generate those isotropic images, you can also generate thick images. This can be done by essentially averaging those slices either in the projections or in the images after they're made. Even though the rows are relatively thin in the Z direction, you still can get your thick slices so that you can do axial reading from the relatively thick slices. And this is preferred because of the contrast to noise, which is better on those thicker slices. If we look at the evolution, a lot of times there's all these different terms that are thrown around, but what really matters most is the actual collimation that you get. So the collimation that is typically specified is actually the collimation at the isocenter. It's not the height at the detector, but it's the collimation at the isocenter because that's what affects the volume that you can image. 20 millimeter collimation is down on the relatively more narrow end of what you'll see today in imaging. A 40 millimeter collimation is quite standard for your bread and butter imaging in an institution. And at the upper end of the spectrum is a 160 millimeter collimation, which a couple of the vendors support right now. It's about the 160 millimeter collimation is that most hearts are about 140 millimeters or less. It can really well cover the vast majority of human hearts with this type of a system. And you can get an image of the human heart which is very consistent and comes from just one rotation or actually a fraction of one rotation. Make images the conventional way, you'd be making one image per one row in the detector. Systems were first introduced, all the vendors were talking about the number of slices equal to the number of rows in the detector. There was a couple of innovations that happened on the systems that allowed the marketing folks to go a little crazy. Factors actually help to improve the image quality in the Z direction by making images that are actually closer together and that also have effectively a higher spatial resolution. There's a couple ways to go about it. One way is to use what is called focal spot deflection in the Z direction. And if you do focal spot deflection in the Z direction, then your focal spot is moving essentially up and down in this direction as the tube is rotating around. And you can take those acquisitions and increase your sampling by having that focal spot deflection. You can also use what we call conjugate rays. X-rays that are spreading out coming from this angle and the X-rays that are spreading out coming from this angle actually are going to be measuring slightly differently. So you take that into account in order to improve your reconstruction and especially the reformat image quality. From a paper that Zhang Shea made several years ago at GE Healthcare. The idea is that, again, traditional reconstruction, you're just reconstructing single slices and there's no overlap between those slices. And then if you take a phantom which has holes drilled out of it and you image it, you'll get an image that looks something like this. Alternatively, if we use that conjugate ray reconstruction so that we can improve the reformat quality, then we need to do higher sampling in order to support that. So we're gonna have actually overlap between our slices. So the difference in the interval between the two slices is actually one half of the thickness. So in that way, if you had a 64 slice system, then you would make 128 slices as you went around in an axial acquisition. And then you can see the improvement in the reconstruction of the different air regions inside of this phantom. You'll see improvements if you use focal spot deflection in the Z direction. There are reasons to use higher sampling in the Z direction. What happened over time is that the vendors now actually talk about the number of slices instead of the number of rows in the detector. So if you take a system that has essentially 32 slices, 
and then you do this overlap reconstruction, then you get 64 slices. It's still the same detector, but you're now actually getting twice as many slices through the focal spot deflection or through conjugate ray reconstruction. Either way, those are good images to make. There's a reason for doing it, but we should not talk about that as being equivalent to a system that actually has twice as many rows. This system over here, where we're actually specifying it in terms of non-overlapping axial images, you can actually have twice as much coverage as on this system here. Looking at a CT scanner, take all these factors into account. It's definitely good to have these modes that offer the increased image quality in the Z direction, but don't be fooled to thinking that they're equivalent to a system that has twice as much coverage. You know why multi-slice CT really took over from single slice CT? But do you know the difference between axial and helical reconstruction and in what conditions you wanna use either one of these? Check out our video on axial versus helical in order to figure out when's the best time to use the different types of reconstruction.